following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The Bar Sufim. Bar Sufim is a plural uh, name that uh, means faces. Bar Suf in Hebrew is a word which means face or image. Continence. So, Parsufim is plural and refers to the different uh, symbols of the tree of life. The way in which we can understand the different triangles and different aspects of the ten sephiroth that, uh, as you know, are the base of Kabbalah, the signs of Kabbalah. So basically, in Kabbalah, we study five Parsufim, five faces, or five symbols, images, countenances. We are going to talk about these five Parsufim and to see how this is related not only with uh, Judaism, Christianity, but also with other religions. And uh, to begin, we have to talk about the first parsuf, which is related with the first triangle of the tree of life that we always talk in many cases, the first triangle of Keter, Chokmah, and Bina, which translated into English are crowned wisdom and understanding. These three Sephiroth spheres or the first triangle are related with what in Kabbalah uh, is uh, named the world of Atziluth, the world of splendors, archetypes. An archetype, we will say, is a 
perfect image or seed of something that eventually develops or evolves into different aspects of matter. That is what we call uh, an archetype. Actually, there is uh, in Sanskrit an atom related uh, with this type of archetype which is called the atom Anu, A-N-U, -A Anu. A primordial atom that is a base of the different modifications or atomic modifications of matter. So, in Kabbalah, we talk about the first parsuf related with this uh, triangle of uh, the world of Atziluth, and that is what in Kabbalah we call Arik Amping. Arikampin, which means the vast continents, the huge continents. It relates, of course, to what in the Sohar uh, it describes as the ancient of ancients that uh, huge man of Zohar, which uses uh, the earth as a base in order to stand the solar system in order to cover his waist, the galaxy in order to cover his chest, and the infinite in order to glow in his face. In his parasuf, we will say in this case. So it is a gigantic symbol, which uh, is described in Judaism as uh, Arikampin. We have to state here something very important, because as you remember, uh, the commandments given to Moses. Uh, one of those commandments says that you shall not make any image. But we have to explain here how this uh, is related with the commandments of uh, Moses, the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments. Because here, of course, in the Zohar, we find this big symbol or image in which we describe Arikampin. And, as I said, it relates with uh, uh, the first triangle of the Tree of Life, which is an emanation of the Ein Sof, of what we call the solar absolute, which in Kabbalah is called Ain, Ain Sof, and Ain Sof Or. The Ain Sof Or is what we call the limitless light. Did uh, this uh, limitless light, as we explained in previous uh, lectures, in Egypt, is symbolized as Ra. But in, uh, in Kabbalah,
in Kabbalah, uh, Moses uh, prohibited to symbolize the Ains of Or, or the Ains of or Ain, because that relates to the space. When we talk about the Ain, the Ains of or the Ains of Or, which is above Keter, we have to understand that this is uh, related with the space. And it is impossible to describe or to symbolize the space. Any symbol of the space will be a form, and the space, well, is a space. That's why in Judaism, in Kabbalah, Moses prohibited to symbolize the ends of or. But uh, he never uh, prohibited to symbolize or to, be, to make an image of the rest of the Sephiroth. As we explain now, since in the Zohar, as I repeat, he described very well how the first triangle is related with Arikampin, the vast continents. And uh, we explain in other lectures that the first triangle of the tree of life plus the absolute, is what they call the Ain Sof, which is where, from where that triangle emanates, is uh, that part that is the fourth part of the holy name of God. Because the first triangle of the tree of life is related to what, what we call God, the Logos, the Word. And uh, the Ein Sof is that part, the space, the abstract space from which that triangle emanates. The first part that emanates is Keter, and then Chokhmah, and then Bina. Or as we say in Christianity, the first part that emanates is the Father, then the Son, then the Holy Spirit. This uh, three plus the Ein Sof, which is the unknowable city, the unknowable part of God, is what is called the Ein Sof, which is the fourth part. That's why in Kabbalah we said that the name of God is Yod He Vav He. The four letters, which in Greek is called the Tetragrammaton. These four letters of the holy name of God in Kabbalah relate in this uh, place to the first triangle. Keter is Yod. Chokma is He, Bina is Bav, and the Ein Sof is the other He, the womb from where the three emanate. So, when you read the, the Zohar, you find the description of this Arikampin, which refers, of course, to those four parts of the holy name of God. They say that Arikampin, the first parsuf, the first face, only shows his right side, never the left. Why? Because the left is that side that goes towards the unknowable, to the abstract, absolute, and that cannot be symbolized. As Moses says, you shall not make any image of that unknowable divine. So, the, 
de First Parsuf Ari Kampin, they related only to Keter, to the Father. But as we learn in Kabbalah and Christianity, we learn that the Holy Trinity or Three Unity, which is that first triangle, are three forces. Three primary forces of the universe that contain each one of them, the other two. Or we will say it better. Each one of them contains the other two, but in the very bottom of any of them is the ains of or the limitless light. So each one of them is a tetragrammaton, is part of that holy name of God that in Kabbalah we name Yod Hava or Jahava, which in the Bible is uh, describes as Jehovah. There's many ways, but Kabbalistically, strictly in Kabbalah we said Jahava or Yod Hava. So, In different uh, religions, you find that they symbolize this parsuf with four phases. For instance, uh, in Hinduism or Brahmanism, the first triangle is represented by Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva that in Hinduism are called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you find that uh, in Hinduism, these parsuf, or parsufim, faces, are represented with four faces. Brahma is always represented with four faces, pointing the four cardinal points of the earth. Of course, we know that... Uh, these uh, symbols of Brahma, and sometimes other symbols of uh, Shiva or, or Vishnu are symbolized with arms or with many faces. The most are always four. Because uh, relate also always to this triangle and the fourth part, which is the abstract absolute, the unknowable, divine. It is very important to understand this because uh, people that ignore that uh, those uh, images that are carved in stone or wood are just symbols or something that has no form. Because if we penetrate into the world of Atziluth, the world of archetypes, of course, we don't find any gigantic being, as many ignorant people think still in this day and age, that God is a gigantic being with a form, standing there in the space. When they want to, or when they read literally the Zohar, ignoring that uh, what the Zohar is describing is just a symbol. Because God itself, that that we call the Logos, is a force, it's an energy, has no form at all. But it can take any form as he wishes, as he wishes, in front of any mystic. For instance, in my case, I had an experience within that universe called the world of Atziluth. And in order for that entity that we call God to appear before me, he took a form. I remember very well when from nothing, from the space, came something and took a form which was a parsuf in front of me. 
And after informing me or telling me what I need to know, immediately disintegrated the form and disappeared. Because God doesn't need the form in order to be. But in order to communicate to you, in order to address you, he can take any form. If you are a Buddhist, you will take the form of Buddha. If you are Christian, you will take the form of a Christian God. Maybe Jesus, or maybe Jehovah. He can take any form that he wishes. And that's why ancient mystics were uh, also carving those uh, images in stone, in wood, in order to point the same thing. But with time, people think or thought, still in this day and age, that uh, God has a form. And that is, of course, incongruent. God, or that that we call God, has no form. It's co- co- coessential with the space. And is the origin of all forms. That's why when we refer to the abstract absolute, we refer, we refer as C-E-T, nor D-E-T, with D, but with S, C-E-T, which means that which has no form. Of course, in Kabbalah, this first Parsuf, or Parsufim, because in reality, it's a symbol of many faces, which, as I said, has four aspects. The triangle plus the abstract absolute. And uh, this uh, first uh, Parsuf, or Parsufim, is what is called Arik Ampin. And uh, relates to the first commandment that is written in the Bible. When you read the first commandment given unto Moses, in the Bible in Deuteronomy, it says there the first commandment, and when you read it, it is divided in four verses. And sometimes people think or misplace this commandment and put the commandment at the second commandment or part of it at the second and misplace the commandments of God in different, in different ways and different numbers because they ignore Kabbalah. But here, since we uh, study the numbers, We are going to study the first commandment, in short, in order for you to understand how it is related to the first triangle. Understanding that the first parsuf, or the parsufim, relates to four elements. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, plus the unknowable divine part, which is the abstract absolute. So, the first commandment starts like this. Thou shalt have no other Elohim before me. This is how it is written in the Bible. Translated Kabbalistically, we will say, Thou shalt have none other Elohim beyond my countenance. Arikampin. Because... Elohim is precisely uh, the word in Hebrew, which means gods and goddesses. 
in the moment that when I say this, it's coming into my mind, that description in the Bible that says, when God created man, he created man into his own image. And then after, immediately after that says, into the image of Elohim, he created them. You see a repetition here. Right? God created man into his own image. That's the first image. And then it's added. Into the image of Elohim, he created them. So there are two Elohims here. The first Elohim is the one that pertains to you. Because in the very depth of our consciousness, of our own spirit, we have our own particular Elohim. Meaning, we have our own particular Tetragrammaton. We have our own particular yod he bab he So there are as many triangles, the first triangle of the tree of life, as many beings in the universe. Each one has its own particular one. But in different degrees or hierarchies. So if you go deep down in meditation into your own, and then you can talk with your own part, as I was explaining you. You can experience that particular Elohim that belongs to you, or that is a superior part of you, and to talk with him. But you discover that has no form, but can take any form. It's called Elohim because Elohim is a plural name. El in Hebrew means God. Eloah means goddess. And the I am at the end of the word Elohim means plural. So it, it, it means different parts of your own divinity within. So as Genesis describes, in the beginning, the man, the human being, was made into the image of Elohim. So Elohim made man into his own image. In the image of Elohim, he made them. Meaning that there are many other Elohim there that are alike. When you name, for instance, Elohim in the second part, we are pointing all the beings that are self-realized, all the beings that reach perfection. As we will say, all the angels are Elohim in themselves. Part of that divinity. So when you said, for instance, the archangel Michael, he in himself is an Elohim, perfect Elohim. The archangel Raphael, he in himself is another Elohim. The archangel Uriel, well, you can name many angels because when you study Kabbalah, you know the names of many angels. Or are in, or is in, in Sanskrit, is called, they are called divas. Gods, masters, they are different names. But particularly in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, they call them angels. But in other religions, as Hinduism, they call it gods, divas, <coughs> masters, Buddhas as well. But here, talking in Hebrew, we said Elohim. So each one of them is an Elohim because each Elohim has many parts, as we are explaining here. That's why it is said that in the beginning God created men into his own image. Into the image of Elohim, he created them. Meaning that when the human being is created, when the perfect human being is created, he himself becomes another 
Elohim. And that's precisely what we want. To perfect all the parts of the tree of life in order to become an Elohim. We are not Elohim right now, but we can become. If the image of our own particular God, our own particular Elohim, is made in us. So, of course, in order to perform that, we have to gather, we have to collect all of the parts which are symbolized in the tree of life. We have to collect all of those parts and we make it one perfect unity with cognizance. Because as you see, for instance, right now, scarcely we are conscious or cognizant of the physical body. Many times we talk about the different parts, like for instance, the mind, the emotional body, the mental body, the causal body, the spirit, and all of the parts of the tree of life we described, but for many of you, is something new. Even though we said that each one of us has all of those parts within. But for you said, well, I didn't know that. I know that, but I am learning now. But why are you ignoring that when all of that is within you? It's because you are unconscious of your own self. That's why in ancient times, there was a, uh, a phrase, an axiom, written in the in the door of the temple of Delphi. Homo nocete ipsum. In Latin. Which means, man, know thyself. So we have to know ourselves. Because we have many parts. And this is precisely what in these lectures we always teach. In different parts, we always point at different parts that we have. So all of those parts, when they are perfected, when they become one, and we are conscious of all of them, this is what in Kabbalah is called Elohim. That is what is called Elohim. So, we have, of course, our own particular Elohim in the depth of our consciousness. But we are not conscious of it. That is what we call self-realization. But those beings that did the effort in the past and became perfected, conscious of that, they became Elohim. That's why I repeat, Genesis says, And Elohim made a man into his own image. Into the image of Elohim he made them. You see, I repeat again. Meaning that your own Elohim is going to make you, as a human being, into his own image. And when you become perfected, and all the parts become one, into the image of the Elohim, he made them. Because there are other Elohim that are already perfected, which we call angels. And other religions called gods. Because Elohim, I repeat, means gods and goddesses. And this is what we have to understand and comprehend. The plurality within the unity. But in order to acquire consciousness or cognizance of all of that that we are within, listen carefully. We don't have to make any image of anything above and below. Because God, or Elohim, made the man into his own image. Empty. The image of God, you know. Any, in this case, we will say, in order you to grasp, there are, of course, inside of us physically, that, that we call the image of God. 
because each one of us has it within. And that is the material with, we, with which we can create the human being into his own image. That image of God is called, in that world of Atiluth, Haya, which means creature and also life. You see? Life and creature is called Haya. It's another called Yehida, which is the likeness, something very high. And of course, that descends, descends into the earth, descends into the matter, and is enclosed within the, uh, what we call the Ruach Elohim. Or what the Bible describes that in the beginning, the Spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim, was hovering upon the face of the waters. That water is the sexual energy. If we are attentive and we are always conscious, of everything at every moment, that means that the image is completely free. And it is using us as a vessel in order for the man to be created. Unfortunately, it's not like that. We are not always aware of ourselves. We We ignore who we are. And we have, unfortunately, many images inside. I, mean, I, I repeat, the image of God is within, is there. But among many images, because the image uses, the image uses, uh, it's, a, it's a vessel that the Spirit uses in order to manifest. You understand that? An image is a vessel that the spirit uses in order to manifest. So when we said that the man was created into the image of God, it means that that man is the vessel of the spirit. Because the man itself is the image that holds the, 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 the spirit of God, that drew our Elohim. And it's a human being. That's a human being. But do we have that uh, spirit within? Are we the vessel of that spirit? Are we the image of that spirit? Absolutely no. No, we are not. Because we are the vessel, listen carefully, of many images. Because the spirit get trapped. Into many images. Many vessels that we created. And that's our problem. Many times we said. In many lectures. That the ego. Is a vessel. What is the ego? Lust is an ego. Anger is an ego. Greed. Gluttony. Laziness. Pride, arrogance, self-esteem, fear, you name it. We have many vessels. And the Spirit of God is trapped, conditioned to those vessels. We will say then that the ego is the hell of God. The particles of God are trapped within the ego. And that's why God suffers within our own ego. And that's why Moses pointed clearly, you have not made any image. But people always place that in the wrong way. They think that you should not take the hammer and the chisel, and to make in the stone or in the wood an image of something. 
Meanwhile, they forget the images that they have in their mind. They forget that any sculpture, in order to carve any image in wood or stone, they might have first the image in his head in order to do it. So there are many uh, idol worshippers that worship images in the world, even though they might be uh, Muslims or Christians or Jude Jews, that they say that they don't worship images because they refer to the outside carved in the physical world. When I say this, it comes into my mind, the Masons, that they use that symbol of the, of the hammer and the chisel. The hammer is a, is a symbol of willpower and the chisel of imagination. You see, for instance, any artist that sculpture anything, like Michelangelo, for instance, that sculpture, uh, the carved Moses, is a beautiful image of Moses. He uses a hammer and, and a chisel in order to do it. He used that. But he had to have in his mind a lot of imagination in order to do that. The imagination is the one that he used it and the willpower. So in the same way, our willpower, the hammer, and the chisel, our imagination, make with our fantasy many images that become idols made of protoplasmic matter inside of us. Every single psychological aggregate, lust, anger, pride, etc., is an idol chisel by our own imagination and fantasy because we use our willpower in the wrong way. When we use Willpower in the wrong way, it is called desire. When you use imagination in the wrong way, it is called fantasy. So obviously, our desires use our fantasy and created a lot of uh, idols inside of us, in our head. If somebody can come with a special device and take all of those idols or images that we have in our mind and put it out and materialize them in front of us, we will run away scared to seeing the ugly things that we have in our mind, in our heart. Those elements that are alive within. So everybody is an idol worshiper. That's the point that the doctrine of Moses is directly going into the soul, into the consciousness. It's not pointing about this, the parsufim that we are talking here. Because I repeat, even in Judaism, in the Zohar, they describe the first parsuf, or parsufim, which is arikampin. They just call it the vast countenance, which is a symbol of that which is the Holy Trinity plus the Ein Sof, where we call it yod he vav he Jehovah or yod Hava. And if you have the, 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 the work or, or the time to read the Zohar, you will read there how they describe the first parsuf, or image, or symbol, or that. Hmm? If Moses prohibited to make images, how come the rabbis of the Zohar are making a description of the first triangle as a big image? This is precisely in Kabbalah what we have to understand. What thing are the symbols of religious symbols of many religions that symbolize something? And another thing are the idols that we have within. When the Bible says you shouldn't worship any idol, it remains, it, it, it's pointing to our own psyche. Not the symbols that we find in many religions. But we cannot deny that there are many people 
that look at those symbols as they are the reality. In Judaism and Christianity, there are many people that describe the men of Zohar and think that really God is a creature there in the space, as I said, a gigantic being with form. And that is ridiculous, ludicrous, because God has no form. God is coessential with the abstract, absolute space. But it can take any form. And what the rabbis of Zohar are doing there is describing, explaining the different parts of the first parsuf, which we call Elohim. And they call it Arikampin, the vast continents. But as we say, in Hinduism or in Buddhism, they also describe different parts of him or different faces, but are symbols. If we think, and we fall in the mistake of many people that think that people think of the ancient wise men describe God or the angels as, as that, and they thought that it was like that. Then we can fall also in the same uh, mistake of thinking that there are people in Asia and in Europe that when they see the flag of the United States that has uh, 50 stars and the stripes and all, they think that that is the United States without ignoring that the flag is only a symbol of this country. It's just a symbol. But not mistake the symbol with the reality. So the flag of the United States is just a flag. Like many countries have their own flag. It's a symbol. But the reality is different. So when we see the symbols of Buddhists or Buddhas or gods or angels or different religions, they're just symbols. As the parts of him that we are describing, that we call the Tetragrammaton or Yahovah. And that's why we find the first commandment that says, uh, Thou shalt have no other Elohim be beyond my countenance. That's the transcription, the other right translation. You shall not have other, other Elohim before me, is what it says. But we know Kabbalah, we said, you, you shall not have other Elohim beyond my countenance. That the continents of Arikampin, the first parasuf, which describes what God is, meaning that we have to have that image as an abstract element, and we don't have to have any other image within, because that image will be an obstacle in order to, to uh, experience the reality of that which is God, which has no form. But I, I repeat, if you enter into your own mind, you will see how many images you have describing many things. And the spirit of God, of the Elohim, is trapped in each one of them. Even the atheists that don't believe in Elohim or in God, they have within themselves many images. Within what that is trapped. And this is something that we had to meditate and analyze profoundly in order to comprehend. And continue the first commandment in the verse 8. It says, Thou shalt not make any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in Shamayim. Shamayim is here. It's called heaven in Kabbalah. Usually Shamayim is related with Da'at. Because Mayim is related with Yesod, the lower waters. 
in, uh, in English is translated as heaven. The superior waters, it says heaven. Or that is in Haaretz, which is the earth, the matter. Or beneath the earth, which is precisely the world of Klippoth, or we call hell. For the image is a garment for the spirit of the man and comes down together with it. So that's why uh, it is difficult for a person in this day and age that wants to create a human being within into the image of God to do it. Because when they go to sex, to the sexual act, which is the place where the Elohim works in order to create. Because we are talking about creation. Nor beliefs. So in order for God to create the human being into his own image, he needs the sexual energy. But when the couple go into the sexual act, they don't have the image of God in their mind, in their vessel. They have just the image of the lust. They have uh, different things. So they are creating or multiplying like animals. Or creating with the satisfaction of lust different elements within themselves that uh, become that that we call ego. So therefore, they are carving. Because in order to carve an image within you, within your, within your psyche... You need energy. And in psychology and or in endocrinology, we study that this area of the solar plex is uh, called uh, the solar plex because it has a lot of solar force within which we create with our desires different elements, psychological elements. We carve them with our fantasy and desire. And in the very sexual act, we know that people that masturbate, they create incubus and subcubus that dwell in their psyche, idols that belong to Klippoth. So, all of us are idol worshippers, and those idols dwell within our own psyche. In our mind, in our heart. If you read the Gospels, how Jesus describes very clear, very clear that the, all the evils that we do come from within the heart. Because they are within us. If we didn't have those images or those idols within, how are we going to do or to have evil thoughts? You thought that evil thoughts come from outside? No, they come from within. Desires come from within. We carry them. So that's why to fulfill the first commandment is to clean first the temple of God. That's why when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he found in the temple, which is his own body, it's described there, merchants, people making businesses in the temple of God, which is our own physical body. But he took the whip which symbolizes willpower, and took all the merchants out. The same thing we have to do. If we want to create a human being into the image of God. Because what we are right now, look at yourselves. What type of images are uh, expressing themselves through your mind, through your heart, through your actions. Observe society. What type of behavior do we have? Obviously, it is not as we think that we are made into the image of God. People think, oh yeah, we are made into the image of God. Well, when I see what is expressing through me, what type of images in my mind, in my heart, this is not God. We are full of idols. We have to clean them. This is why Jesus taught to us, 
to take the whip and to take all those merchants out of our own temple. To do that, it's a great work, psychological work, and to accomplish with the first commandment, which is related with that, with the image of God. We had to, don't to, to carve or don't to make any image here, here, and all the three brains, and all the parts. When we study Kabbalah, we know well that that first commandment relates to our three brains. Intellectual brain, emotional brain, a motor instinctual sexual brain. And continue the first commandment saying, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, Yod or Jahava or Jehovah, the Tetragrammaton, am thy Elohim, a jealous Elohim, or a jealous God, as says the, the Bible. No? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. No? Who are those that hate uh, uh, Elohim, a particular God? Well, those are called the unfaithful ones, the hidden. Lust is one, anger is another one, pride is another one, greed is another one, laziness, gluttony, you name them. Those are the ones that hate our own particular Elohim. And that's why we don't manifest that image in us. And of course, that is related with Chokhmah. Because Chokhmah is faithfulness. It's called what we call the holy denying. When we start working against our own defects and vices, we're working with the second aspect of that arikampin, which is related with the first triangle of Asilut. So then, says the number 10, in showing mercy, Unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Okay. Mercy is Hesed. This is how you say it in Hebrew. Hesed. And Hesed is the innermost, is our own particular spirit. In other words, when you accomplish with that, that Elohim above shows us our own particular chesed inside of us. Hmm? That particular spirit within. When you see your own chesed, your own spirit, your own mercy, and then you understand that in order to incarnate it in your body, you need to clean yourself. You need to accomplish with the first commandment. Because... Mercy is the outcome of the first triangle. That is what is called the Ruach Elohim. The Spirit of God. What is that Spirit of God? The Spirit of God is your own particular individual spirit within. Because Elohim is above. That's why the first commandment, as you see, is divided in many parts because we relates to Keter, Chokmah, Bina, which are three plus Yain Sof, four, that is a famous tetragrammaton, Yod He, Vav He, Jehovah, of the highest. And in order for that, those forces to be inside of us and to make the human being to his own image, which is Hesed, Ruach Elohim, we need, of course, to work a lot and to disintegrate a lot of images, idols that we have within. Because that Elohim visit us. He comes inside of us. He said that I visit, he says there, 
uh, let me read. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. That means that you think that God is always entering inside of us, visiting us, and seeing all the iniquity that we have within. That is the ancient of ancients. Because each one of us has his own part. He gave, he gave us that part in order for us to develop. But instead of developing that Ruach Elohim, in order to make the human being into his own image, we just have other images. And we make a, a habit, a chaos of each one of us. Jesus of Nazareth, somebody that will say that is a vessel of that image. Moses, a vessel of that image. Abraham, a vessel of that image. Buddha, a vessel of that image. So in different pantheons and different religions, you find many masters that became the vessel of that image. But of course, they call that image not uh, Ruach Elohim, because many of them are not Hebrew. They speak other languages. In Sanskrit, I repeat, they call it Buddha. Buddha means illuminated one, which relates to Hesed. In other pantheons, they describe that Parsufim, for instance, in the, among the Aztecs, they call it uh, uh, Ometekutli, the first part, Quetzalcoatl, the second, and Tlaloc, the third. That's in their own language. If we describe and study that language, we'll see that it's describing the same thing. So, this is what we have to understand, because when you visit or you study other religions, other symbols of other religions, you find a lot of those parasufim, faces. Like, for instance, in the Egyptian pantheon, you find that those parasufim, or, or symbols, faces, are, of course, made with a human being, body of a human being, in the face of a bird, of a bull, of many faces. This is symbols. This is not like the ancients were worshipping idols that people think. Because they were they knew about the images in the psyche and they knew about this parts of him that we're talking here. Because for instance, there is a book in the uh, Old Testament in the Bible written by Ezekiel, a great prophet. In the first chapter of the book of Ezekiel, he describes a parsufim. Hmm? He says that uh, is a, a creature with four faces. One is an eagle, another lion, another is an ox, and another is in the face of a man, and has, instead of legs, hooves of a goat. And you, just, you see that, and this is what I mean. You shouldn't make any image. So how come Ezekiel, a great prophet, is doing that image there? Because he is referring to a parsufim, which has nothing to do with worshiping idols. When you understand and comprehend that, you understand that the commandment of Moses, don't worship in images, is related with something psychological. And that's why I repeat, the first commandment is divided in four steps. That we have to study, because are related to the Tetragrammaton, which is the holy name of God. And of course, after that uh, first commandment, follows the, there's no written here, but we know. Uh, the fourth command, I mean the, the rest of the command, the second, the third, the fourth, which people misplace because they ignore Kabbalah. The second commandment says you shall not 
uh, pronounce the name of God in vain. When you study Kabbalah, you know that the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, appears for the first time in the world of Chokhmah, the second Sephira. The name of God in Chokhmah, in the world of Atsilut, is yod he vav he Jehovah, yod Chava, or Jahava, whatever you name them. So that is the holy name of God. So, of course, the second commandment relates to Chokmah. And the third, you shall keep the Sabbath holy. That's the third commandment. Relates to Bina. When you study Kabbalah, you know very well that Sabbat or Shabbat or the Sabbatai, the Sabbath, is related with Bina. Bina <coughs> is the Holy Spirit. And Bina, the name of God, receives the name of Jehovah Elohim. And then you see the, the second time that appears the name of God in the first triangle, Jehovah, but Elohim. That means that that Jehovah is many. Each particular Elohim has his own Jehovah. But that Jehovah is uh, manifested. Or his power is manifested in the second and third Parsufim. According to the five parts of theme that we are talking here. Because we said that the first is Arikampin. And that is Arikampin is the vast continents that is related to the first triangle. Keter, Chokma, Bina, plus the ains of the absolute, the tetragrammaton. That's the first uh, parsuf or face symbol that we are studying. But now we are going to enter into a study the second and third parsuf, the parsufim, which relates to the world of Da'at, which relates to the world of Bria, the world of creation. And in Da'at, we find... which in Kabbalah is called Abba and Ima, or Abba and Aima, father, mother, the duality. In many lectures we explained that this Arikampin unfolds and separates itself into two halves. The masculine and feminine. Ava and Aima, father and mother. And those are which are uh, which we call the second and third parasufim or phases that we study in Kabbalah. And that also are studied in many religions. Because God as father is wisdom. And God as mother is love. And that's why you find here. In that. That division. But for that many times we said that we had to understand the first parsuf. Which in other lectures we said is related with Osiris Ra. In Egypt. They call the three parts of the first triangle Osiris. And the upper part from which that triangle emanates, they call it Ra, the solar absolute, or the ends of or, in other words. So when they were naming Osiris Ra, they were naming the Tetragrammaton, the four parts in one being. Of course, 
that Osiris Ra or Jehovah is an androgynous being, a symbol of the two polarities in one. Two polarities, masculine and feminine, in one. But here in that, those parts, masculine and feminine, are separated. In Ava and Aima, or Ava and Ima, father, mother. And that's why you find that uh, the mystery of that Ava and Aima are related with the uh, Sabbath or Sabbath, or what uh, they sell also, Sabbatot, plural. Because in reality, in Kabbalah, we study three Sabbaths. Remember that uh, commandment, the third commandment, states, keep the Sabbath holy. The first Sabbath is related with Bina, the duality, above, let's call it the superior Sabbath, where we find Ava and Aima, where we find the two polarities of God, which are called Jah, the father, and Hava, the mother. So, Jahava is father, mother, is the other aspect, an unfoldment in the world of Bria, which is also called the world of creation. So, these two parts of him are found in many religions. The personification of the father and the mother, as for instance, uh, Jupiter and in Era, in the Greek or Roman pantheon, Zeus and Era, you find, for instance, here in Hinduism, uh, Shiva Shakti, which is a symbol, of course. Shiva is the father, and Shakti the mother. Forces. So in many religions you find different symbols of this father and mother. Moses, of course, wrote the fourth commandment to those two polarities. It says, honor father and mother. That's the fourth commandment. And it's given to the fourth because the fourth is Chesed. Chesed is the emanation of Ava and Aima, of father and mother. The, the spirit that we have within is the Son of God. That's why that commandment goes directly to our own spirit. Honor. Father and mother. So, honor father and mother is the fourth commandment. That's precisely the position. Because relate to our own spirit. He is the one that has to honor Ava and Aima. And how does that spirit honors Ava and Aima? By accomplish with the third commandment, which is keep the Sabbath holy. How does the spirit keep the Sabbath holy? He does it through his human soul. Because the spirit has two souls. A divine soul called Gebura and a human soul called Tifereth. So that human soul Tifereth is also called the second Sabbath. Because the third part of Sabbatot is Malkut. That's called the third Sabbath, called night. Why it's called night? You see, because it's under the moon, which is Yasod. And Tifereth is symbolized by the sun. 
that is the day. That's why the Sabbath here down is divided in the night and the day. You see, when you enter into Saturday, which is the Sabbath day, you start in the night, in the evening, when the sun sets. That's the first part of the Sabbath. But then, when the sun rises, that's the other Sabbath, which is called, of course, the Seir Ampin, the symbol of Tifereth. Or we will say the symbol of the whole monad. Because the whole monad in itself, which is Chesed, Gebura, and Tifereth, are precisely one unit. Remember that in Greek, monad, monas, means unity, one. So are we were studying in the first triangle the unity of God as a trinity or as a tetragrammaton? Here down in the second triangle, we find our own particular individual unity as a spirit, divine soul, and human soul. And that is what is related with the second part of the Sabbath, superior Sabbath. And the lower Sabbath, of course, is Malkut. Or as we will say, the first Sabbath is the man, and the second Sabbath is the woman. I mean, the third Sabbath is the woman. Man above, woman below, related with the tree of life. Tifereth, which is a Seir, Seir Ampin, Seir Ampin is another Parasuf. You see, Ava Ava and Ima O Aima, we said too, is father, mother. This is the first parsuf, this is the second, this is the third. And the fourth is Sauron Ampin. The Sauron Ampin, or Savir Ampin, is represented by Chesed, Geburati, Fered, Netzah, Hod, Yesod. These six together form what we call the Sauri Ampin. And the fifth, which is Malkut, is the last Parsuf, uh, which is called Nubva. This is how the Parsufim are divided according to the Tree of Life. Adikampin, Ava and Aima, Sauri Ampin and Nubva. So Nukva is the third Sabbath. Sawirampin is the second Sabbath. And Ava and Aima form the first Sabbath, or the higher, superior one. That's why in many parts of the Bible it says, you have to keep my Sabbaths, plural, holy. You know? It doesn't mean that every Saturday you have to keep the day and not to work and to rest. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that you have to keep holy Ava and Aima, the Sawirampin, and Nukva, which is the Malkut, the three Sabbaths. Sababat, the army of the voice or the way in which God expresses or performs his work. Because Bina, the Holy Spirit, is the one that divides itself into two. In that, in order to sanctify the Sabbath. Because in Sabbath is where the initiate creates. That's the mystery why uh, uh, in the Bible, in the Gospels, they talk about... Uh, the different events that Jesus performed in Sabbath. Some people think that refers to the Saturday. 
No, it refers to the work that he performs and he's doing and any initiate does, which is related with the three Sabbaths. Because you have to perform the great work through the, through the three Sabbaths. I am not going to go deeper into it because it implies a lot. It's related with the work of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is related with the superior parts of the tree of life in us and related also with the sexual act. In order for you to understand that, I just uh, copy something from the book of Isaiah related with these Sabbaths. In the chapter 56 in Isaiah, uh, the verse 4 says the following. For thus saith Jahava. You see? Ava and Aima, Jahava. That is an emanation of the superior Jehovah of Arikampin. It says this. Unto the Eunuchs. He said this to the Eunuchs. Eunuchs. Unto the Eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths. Plural. And choose the things that please me. And take hold of my covenant. These verses are a lot. Who are those eunuchs that keep the Sabbaths holy and that choose the things that please Jehovah and that take hold of his holy covenant? For that, of course, we have to know about the mystery of that, where the first Sabbath appears. The superior Sabbath, which where Bina works as Ava and Aima, which is a division. Because many Kabbalists, they think that because Father is wisdom, so the Father is Chokmah, and that Bina is the mother. But they don't understand that Bina is just an unfoldment of Chokmah. So really, in that, Ava and Aima is a division of the Holy Spirit, Bina. Because Bina is ruled by Saturn. Saturn is Shabbatai, the seventh day, related with the Holy Spirit. And in order to keep the Sabbath holy, or the Sabbath, which means Ava and Aima, Tifereth and Malkut, in order to keep all of those three parts holy and pure, well, you have to be a, a eunuch. You know that to be a eunuch is a different ways to understand that. Because Jesus says in the Bible, there are some eunuchs that are made eunuchs by men. It means that some men in different parts of the world, they take men and they cut their testicles. And they are made eunuchs. So they are made eunuchs by men. There are other eunuchs that are being born eunuchs from their mother's womb. It's another thing. This is a symbol. Meaning that there are some people that are chaste, not necessarily that are being born without testicles. Meaning, like for instance, the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama was born eunuch. Means that he never touches a woman. He has his sexual organs, of course. But he, he was born like that because he is a master. He's a reincarnation, a being that was perfected. And now he is a eunuch by his own choice. I mean, from his mother's womb. But then Jesus says, and... There is other that make themselves eunuchs for the love of the kingdom of God. Meaning, in this case, people that ignore about the sexual force or the mystery of Sabbath, 
when they understand the mystery of Da'at, which is the mystery of sexuality, and then they start taking care of the sexual force. They don't spill the sexual force because that is the meaning of being a eunuch to restrain from being an animal. And that's why among the symbols of Ezekiel, among that beautiful symbol of the, of the parts of him that he described in his book, among the animal that is there, it doesn't say a bull, it's O-X, ox. And what is an ox? It's a castrated bull. There's a symbol. I mean, in other words, also, for instance, in Christianity, you find that, that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, uh, they celebrate and they put beside in the stable of Bethlehem a mule and an ox. You think that that is just by casualty? It's a symbol. A mule is a, an animal that is a mixture or crossing of a horse with a donkey or a donkey with a mare. The mule cannot multiply. There is not a, a male mule and a female mule that you can multiply to make more mules. No. In order to make another mule, you need another donkey and another horse. This is just a hybrid animal. So that means that it's something related with the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. It's related with that mule, which means that cannot multiply, that is utilizing the sexual energy in the secret way. And the ox also, that is there in the stable of Bethlehem, is also the animal that is castrated. In other words, the symbol of being a eunuch, meaning that you are giving all the sexual energy to your own particular individual Ruach Elohim in order to make the image of God. So that is the symbol of being a eunuch. In other words, as Paul of Tarsus explained also, and we said in other, in other verses, those who are single, who have no wife, is good. They remain like that. But if you are married, well, being married as or, or being married or keep being single with your wife. Being married, be as you were single. Meaning that when you are single and you know the doctrine, you will transmute your sexual energy. So if you marry, well, keep doing the same thing, but in the sexual act, don't spill, transmute it. That's to be a eunuch. That's why uh, there were many <coughs> masters in the past that were not having children. In the case of Abraham and Sarah, for instance, Abraham was a eunuch because he was uh, transmuting the sexual energy. She, he knew the path. And also Sarah. But there are many ways in order to have children of God without spilling the energy like the animals. And that is the secret of Sabbath. Of course, uh, uh, this implies many other things. Because uh, when you arrived on the symbol of Nukva, which is Malkut, which is the fifth Parsuf, then you find that there are five types of women. Or we will say five Eves. Oh, I mean, no, four. No, no, five, no, four types. Four types of Eves. Or Havas. As we said in, in Hebrew. Because Malkut Receive all the strength of the tree of life. Or as we said, receive all the four rivers of Eden. 
the four rivers of Eden that in other lectures we said symbolize the four elements, but also are forces that manifest in the initiate, in his physical body, in his own nukva, because the malkut, the physical body, is a nukva that you have to keep holy to. Tifereth, which is the second Sabbath, is your human soul. You have to keep also your soul holy. Because it's Sabbath. Three Sabbaths. First, honor your father and your mother. Not the first Sabbath. Second Sabbath. You shall not commit fornication. That is related with your soul. And the fifth. Nukva, which is the physical body. That you have to know how to handle it. Because the whole work is, is made through it. Of course, when we talk about Malkut, the fifth uh, parsuf or symbol, always we point to women. Because Malkut is feminine. It means that our physical body is feminine. Even if we have masculine body, it is feminine. But of course, the woman is more Malkut than any Malkut because she on top of having a physical body that is feminine, she is feminine. So the whole symbol of Malkut, Nukva, goes to the wife, to the woman. But relates also to the physical body of the man, because our own particular Malkut. This is what we have to understand. Because when we read Kabbalah, when we study Kabbalah, or we read the Bible, the earth, Malkut, relates to the physical body but concretely relates more to the woman than to the man. So then you find four types of women. The first is called Eve Venus. Is the animalistic, instinctive, and brutish female. But that also relates to our own body, as I repeat. Venus I mean, Eve Venus is what in, in the Zohar, in Kabbalah, is called Lilith. Lilith. Because Lilith is a negative ray of Venus. You see, Venus has two rays, the positive and the negative. The positive is represented by Anael, the angel of love. And the negative ray of Venus, which is darkness, fornication, sexual violence, is Lilith. So, of course, Eve, Hava, relates directly also to the sexual organs, male or female organs. So, when we use Hava in the wrong way, we are, of course, polarizing ourselves with Lilith. Remember that in the symbol of in the body, the physical body, Adam is the brain, and Eve is the sexual organs. Adam is the brain, Eve is the sexual organs. This is how always you have to study in relation with your physical body. So, of course, the sexual organs, Eve, or called Hava, is the mother of all living beings. Right? Because... Without a sexual organ, we cannot be alive. The sexual organ of our father and mother created us physically. So that's why Eve is called Hava, mother of the, of the living. In here in the physical plane, of course, because there's all other means. But this uh, Eve Venus or Eve Lilith is only that part of the man or the woman that utilizes the sexual act for pure animal satisfaction. That's why instinctive and brutish, of course, in the, in the side of, of women, we see that type of uh, women that only want to satisfy their animalistic desires. They fall into prostitution and all type of degeneration. Lesbianism, prostitution, is related to Lilith. The way in which women utilizes Lilith, as well homosexuality in men. Mm -hmm. Only utilizing a sexual act 
their own chava, their own sexual organ, for the pure animalistic satisfaction. But then we find the second type of Eve, which is called Venus Eve. This Venus Eve is related, of course, with Anael, the positive aspect of Venus. That type of woman, or that type of person, that uh, is faithful to their own partner, and they form a beautiful home, and uh, they have children, and uh, this type of Eve is faithful and knows how to love the man that take care of her. Is the type of woman that is a woman of home, of, of house, housewife. This is something that comes into my mind about Gurdjieff. He says, we have to know and to, to, to see the difference between a woman prostitute and a woman wife. Obviously, the woman wife is that one that marry and have to have children, multiplies, and is faithful to one man, which is very difficult to find in this day and age, by the way. But also a man that have using their own sex in you know, order to satisfy is difficult because there are many images that we have within. The third type of uh, Hava or woman is called Venus Urania. You see, Uranus, among the Greeks, is heaven. And heaven, in Hebrew, is Shamayim. Shamayim, I told you in the beginning, is related with that. So, in other words, is related to Ava and Aima. When you said Venus Urania, means that type of female that is very spiritual. He says, very conscious, filled with deepest of both spiritual and human feelings. The type of woman that wants to self-realize, that walk on the path of the self-realization. We will say this type of woman is a repented prostitute other type of men as well, a repented sinner that follows the path of the spirit and know how to be a eunuch, how to take care of the sexual energy because that's the only way for us to walk on the path because I remember and I repeat for you, Hava is in relation with the sexual organs. And in order to be a eunuch, you have to take care of your Hava, your physical body, and walk the path of Venus, which is love, towards Shamayim, Urania, the heavens. That's the path of initiation. Now, those women that reach self-realization, like, for instance, John of Arc, Madame Blavatsky, Perenelli, the wife of uh, this great master in India, Mataji, another, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, and many other great women that reach self realization, they reach the level of Urania Venus. For instance, Mary, the mother of Jesus of Nazareth, is a Urania Venus, a master that reached the self realization and now comes and serves as a vehicle. For a master to come and to incarnate and to do something for humanity. That's why you find many religions. That Urania Venus becomes the mother of great avatars. And all the stories of great avatars or messengers, there is always a woman that is fecundated by the force of the Holy Spirit, which is Uranus, which is Bina. Because if you know, if you remember the story of Uranus, was the force of the Holy Spirit, of course, the force of life. It says that he created in the beginning many beings. But then uh, Saturn came and castrated him, took the testicles out of him, and took it half of the throne. 
the testicles fell on the sea, and from the foam came Aphrodite, Aphrodite, which means foam, from the ocean, which in Roman terms is Venus. The goddess Venus, the god of love. This is a symbol, of course, a very deep symbol of how the Holy Spirit unfolds in different aspects that we had to study. So, of course, Urania Venus is a symbol of Aima, the mother, in other words. They become the symbol of the mother. That's why Mary, or the vision of Carmel, the mother of Jesus, took the symbol of Aima, of that. It's not that she, in particular, is the only Aima or Ima of that, no. It just symbolizes that in Christianity. But you find a symbol of the feminine aspect of the superior part of Hava in many religions. For instance, the mother of Buddha was Maya, which is another symbol of Urania Venus, the higher aspect of that level of, in the feminine uh, level of, of men and women. So you find here, for instance, talking about the Nukva, Right, the fifth parsuf, which is related with women, of women. You find many symbols that could be positive or negative symbols. Because the woman, the first type of woman that is called uh, Eve Venus, created with Lilith, takes all the attributes, all the forces from Klipoth, which is hell, manifests all the animalistic forces. Which, unfortunately, in this day and age, you find a lot of women with a lot of force. But there are also many women that in this day and age are entering into the path. And they are turning into the third type. Otherwise, uh, in, or in other words, I mean, there are others that still want to be mothers. With the second aspect, you know. Because it, of course, is a beautiful uh, mission of any woman, and any female, is to be a mother. And that's something that is being born in them always. The longing of having a child, which is beautiful. It's a great sacrifice. But uh, when they overcome that feeling, they enter into the third type. And they apply that feeling, that longing for a child inside and walk on the path. And then they are the mother of Isaac, Isaac the only one which is something spiritual too. But remember, the symbol of the five parts of film that we are studying here are symbolized in many religions in different ways. Mm -hmm. Because when we ignore this, we think that uh, people are worshipping idols, etc. Like for instance, uh, uh, many people uh, Fundamentalist Christians, they don't worship the Divine Mother, Mary, because they think that is not necessary. But if we want to go to heaven, we need the second aspect, Ima, the feminine aspect to work with, because is that the mystery of Sabbath. If you want to keep the Sabbath holy, you need to know the mystery of that. You know the mystery of Tifereth and the Nukva down here. Because the Nukva is related with four parts, the four rivers of Eden, the four rivers of Yesod, which the book of Genesis talk about. That's why Abraham had four wives. That's why Jacob had four wives. Those four aspects are related to the four rivers of Eden. And you remember that we stated in other lectures that Hesed is Abraham, Isaac is Geburah, Jacob is Tifereth, represent the three parts of the monad. If you multiply the four rivers of Eden by three, you have twelve. These twelve wives of these patriarchs represent the development that we had to acquire within the story of Abraham, the story of Isaac and Jacob. Because remember that in the end, the 12 tribes end in Mazarim, 
which is Malkut. And from there, Moses takes them. This is just an initiatic mystery that we are talking here only in general. Every single parsuf encloses a lot of wisdom. All the parts of him together, which are five, encloses the whole work that we have to perform. And that is described in many holy books, not only in the Bible. Do you have questions? Mm-hmm. And then you put um, the four main commandments on the board. Each one is a Zoma. Ava and Aima, father and mother, honor father and mother, that commandment relates to the first Sabbath. Because Ava and Aima, or Ima, is a division a split of the two forces of Bina. Because that Bina, in reality, is the higher Sabbath. That's Bina, the Holy Spirit. The seven, it's called Shabbatai, Saturn. But this Shabbatai, Saturn, Bina, Holy Spirit, divides in two. Because the Holy Spirit is the creator, masculine and feminine. And that is Ava and Aima. So that's why when we talk about the higher Sabbath, we talk about Bina and that together. That's the first Sabbath that we had to keep holy. Keep my Sabbath holy. You have to be a eunuch. You have to take care of your sexual energy in order to keep the Sabbath holy. The second aspect is Tifereth. That's the day. That's the sun. And the night of the Sabbath is a woman. It's called the Nukba which, as we said here, divided in four types related to the four rivers. Hmm? Now you understand the Bible. Because Abraham had a child with a slave, which is related with one type of, of the river. Sarah, of course, represents the higher forces above, the higher Sabbath. So, in other words... In order to keep the Sabbath holy, doesn't mean that you have to worship Saturday. That means something else more profound. Saturday is just a symbol. Yeah? So, being a eunuch is a form of being a Jew? Yeah. The only way to keep the Sabbath holy is by being a eunuch. Mean. By taking care of your sexual energy and not wasting it as an animal. Yeah? Um, in regards to the four types of food, does that apply simply to women and does it apply to both male um, and women? Of course, as I said in the beginning, the woman is individually, physically, is called Eve, Chava, because she is the one that gives you birth. But if you talk about in your physical body, that Hava is your sexual organ, which also helps in the given birth. Because in order for a woman to be a Hava, a giver of life, she needs your sperm. She needs your own particular Hava, your own. That's why it is written that in Sabbath, men and women are face to face. Let me read something for you in the beginning of the commandments, that is very hidden, but very good to you, for you to understand. It says at first, And Moses called, meaning gathered, all the parts of Israel, which means Tifereth, because Israel is the inner name of Jacob, which is Tifereth, and said unto them, 
Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep them and do them. Jahavah, our Elohim, made a covenant with us in Oreb. That holy covenant is sexual covenant. Mystery of sex, as it says the eunuchs. Yahavah made not this covenant with our fathers. Who are our fathers? Ava and Aima. That's our parents. Huh? Father and mother. That's our parents. He didn't make that covenant with them. Because they are holy. But we are unholy. So we need to be in chastity. Right? But with us, he says, made that covenant. Even us, who are all of us here alive this day. Alive, when you say alive, means the living in Tifereth. In that part is where you are alive, here in this area. The second triangle is where you are alive. Because the rest is the world of the dead. Jehovah talked with you face to face in the mount out of the mist of the fire. The mist of the fire is the mount of Hesed. The innermost, the spirit. That's called the mist of fire. Is where you hear your own Jehovah. But in order to listen, to hear, you have to be face to face. Face to face means in the sexual act. Because only in the sexual act is when men and women are face to face. That's the mystery of Sabbath. Face to face. Meaning sexual contact, but not like animals. Elohim. Yeah, they are joining on to make an Elohim. Yeah, this is precisely to make an Elohim because El is masculine and Eloah is feminine. United, they make what call Elohim. An Elohim. I stood between Jehovah and you at that time to show you the work of Jehovah, for you were afraid by reason of the fire. What is to be afraid of reason of the fire? Well, the fire that in the sexual act rises. You know what I mean? And you have to be afraid because the beginning of wisdom is to be afraid of Jehovah, which is a sexual force, not to spill it. So Moses is precisely the intermediary between you and God when you are in the sexual act, which means willpower, because Moses is willpower. That's the symbol of it. And did you, you didn't go up into the mount, saying, I am Jehovah thy Elohim, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Out of bondage. And then they follow the commandments. Meaning that here in this physical world, we are in, the, in bondage. Bondage of all the idols of Egypt. If you like. Because in Egypt there's a lot of idols. But this Egypt is Mazarin, means your physical body. And if you go inside your physical body, you find a lot of idols. So we are slaves of Egypt, meaning the physical body. Because there is a lot of images that we explained in the beginning. doesn't mean Egypt there in the Middle East or in Africa. This is something different. You have to know how to read the scriptures in order to understand what you're reading. Because people misinterpret things and they fall in many mistakes. Your question? With the Hebe? Well, that Hebe Venus woman has to transform herself into Venus Urania. A man. What do you mean, a male? Yes. But I repeat, if she transforms herself into Venus Urania. So a male cannot self Because. Oh. Well, oh, the question is, if, if the woman likes to be uh, Eve Venus, likes to fornicate, well, that's a lot of work that he has to do. Because if the woman doesn't enter into the path and the man does it, the man is a eunuch, but if the woman likes to fornicate, well, it's a lot of fighting in order to be a eunuch there. 
Because if the woman cooperates, it's very easy to be a eunuch. But if the woman doesn't cooperate, well, you have to use a lot of skill in order not to fall into fornication. Yeah, it's hard. Obviously, if the man is very strong, like Samson, you see, Samson in the beginning were, were with prostitutes, and meaning that he went in to help, right? But at the end, he went with Delilah, and Delilah was stronger than him. Delilah, the Lilith, you see? And he pulled him down. And that was the end of Samson. He was very strong, but Delilah, believe me, there are many women that have a very strong instinct. And the main thing here is that for that you have a very, to have a very strong, powerful Moses within, which is willpower. Well, the problem with uh, Samson was that uh, he uh, wanted to help Delilah, and it happened with many bodhisattvas. The story of another bodhisattva that was sent with a prostitute in order to help. Because the prostitute was a fallen too. A fallen soul. So his being sent him to help that prostitute. And when he was trying to raise a prostitute, which is the only way, is by performing the sexual act. Because to teach her how to transmute. Behold here the mystery of Mary Magdalene and Jesus. This is something very, very, very hidden. Of course, not everybody is uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Not everybody is Moses. Most of them are Samson's. And uh, they end uh, uh, spilling. And they lose all their power. So you have to, as a man, you have to calculate. You know, because a woman really has a lot of power. And if you try to help a woman that is falling, it's good. But if you are not with a lot of strength, it's better if you find a, a Venus Eve that is faithful. Because a Lilith woman is very difficult. Not impossible. Not impossible. Because everything is possible. You know, remember Mary Magdalene symbolizes that. She changed drastically. But not all the prostitutes in the world wants to be Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Be called what? Or crowned. Oh. Uh, no, the, the, the Venus Urania is the woman that knows the mysteries of Sabbath and that transmutes the sexual energy with her husband. That's the Venus Urania. Not a believer. It has nothing to do with believing in anything. It's a woman that knows how to take care of their sexual energies. Like Sarah, the wife of Abraham. She said that she was sterile, right? But because she didn't fornicate as well, Abraham didn't fornicate. But later on, she had Isaac, which is, of course, something spiritual inside. Because to have a child here in this physical world, when you transmute your energy, is very easy. Because when you transmute your energy, you become super fertile. Super fertile. So in order not to spill and to keep the path is to be a eunuch. 100% is very difficult. It's not easy. But it's not impossible. That's why the great masters are called eunuchs. But in order to be a eunuch, you need to perform the sexual act. Because that quality, that gift, is something that you have to create with your own actions. In the very sexual act, That's the covenant. That's why Jehovah says, keep my covenant holy, clean. Meaning the covenant between the two sexes, the two sexual organs. 
when they are united, behold the covenant of the Holy Spirit. But who keeps that covenant holy? It is enough to reach the spasm of the orgasm in order to be filthy. So only the eunuchs keep the Sabbaths holy. So, thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,